on this episode of the Haunted Objects Podcast. You know what's weird? We can keep having that issue where people are farting on us. Yeah. You know what's funny? Yours was uh, in your face, and I was sitting on the ground oh, behind so that him. Was in I your was face. directly downwind from Big Fart, and he got me. <laughs> he tagged me. <laughs> From deep inside the mysterious archives of the New Kirk Museum of the Paranormal, it's the Haunted Objects Podcast. What's your favorite Jeff Goldblum film? So the first Jeff Goldblum movie that I saw when I was a small child was The Fly, and that was a mistake. <laughs> hey, you so, saw, how, how small are we talking? Young. Like, I was like six or seven. <gasps> yeah. and Who did that to you? I saw it on TV when I wasn't supposed to be watching oh. it. And it scared me, and I was afraid of Jeff Goldblum until <laughs> Jurassic Park. Oh, I and, see. And then I was not scared of Jeff You Goldblum. saw that chest, and you were like, oh, I'm not I mean, afraid that's of this anymore. kind of scared me, too, a little bit. But <laughs> no, I just thought he was really cool. I was like, he's a cool scientist He always guy. plays a cool scientist guy. Yeah, he's very good at it. Listen, I'm going to get flack for this, but Independence Day, probably. It's a great movie. It's not. <laughs> it's objectively a terrible movie. No! It is, but I, I have a sense of nostalgia for it. I love Roland Emmerich films. They're yeah. just insane. Yeah. So I always, every time I think about Jeff Goldblum, that was my first introduction to him. Really? Yeah, I well, think was it was. Jurassic Park? Uh, I don't think so. My parents were weird, man. I didn't yeah. get to see a lot of that stuff when I was young. It was super religious. Independence Day is good, though. <laughs> I mean, you've got aliens. That's true. You've I got... loved Independence Day. They blow up the White House. They blow up the White House. They, The aliens looked awesome in it. They do look awesome. They it's a great... Cool. It's my mom's favorite movie. There's something about Jeff Goldblum that is very otherworldly. Mm -hmm. It's He's a strange character. He's existed in the world of cinema forever. It seems like he's just existed forever he's yeah. completely beloved and we got to take him bigfoot hunting we did today's episode is about jeff goldblum's squatch knocker from deep inside the forests of north america strange and mysterious sounds have been haunting nervous outdoorsmen for decades Echoing through the trees in the middle of the night, these otherworldly howls are believed to be the screams of the legendary monster known as Bigfoot. Sasquatch experts agree that these spine-chilling vocalizations can be instigated by striking a tree with a simple baseball bat, a process known as squatch knocking. While a good tree knocker is standard issue in any Bigfoot hunter's kit, this particular knocker is special. Carved with a powerful sigil, this rare tool has been ritually charged by another of the world's most enduring mysteries, beloved actor Jeff Goldblum. No, I'm not kidding. This Squatch Knocker is a relic from the weirdest paranormal investigation ever. The time Greg and Dana Newkirk took Jeff Goldblum on a Bigfoot hunt. The idea behind the tree knocks is that they're maybe doing a, a few different things. One of them can be they are calling out that there's prey nearby, uh, talking to other Bigfoot. Uh, non-verbally giving them communication that like, hey, there's prey in the area. Have we ever considered that it's, it could just also be playing? Like they could just be playing? I mean, no one really knows. No. In fact, we don't even know exactly how that sound is being made. There's different theories on that sound itself. Yes, I've heard of that. That they're potentially using their throat to make that sound. Yeah, that it's like a clicking noise that they're making with their throat somehow naturally. Yeah. And it just sounds like uh, hollow wood knocks. I, it makes me think of like a bullfrog. Like, they, like right. they're extending some part of their throat to make this weird clicking sound. Right. Cliff Berrickman from Finding Bigfoot also runs the North American Bigfoot Center uh, out in Boring, Oregon. Uh, really great Bigfoot museum. He has a theory that it's not a throat click. It's not uh, a tree knock. It's actually Bigfoot taking his hands together and clapping really loud. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a method of communication. 
so many people have captured vocalizations and, and Bigfoot hooping and like hollering and making sounds that I almost feel like the knocking and that, the, you know, the clicking and that kind of stuff, like tree knocking and like also rocks, like they'll bang rocks, rocks is together. Rocks a big one too. I almost feel like it's sort of like they're testing to see if you're going to pay attention to it or not. I mean, I have no idea why in the world they would be doing it. I, there's Again, this is all theory. Nobody really knows. Yeah. I mean, frankly, sometimes when we're at Salt Fork, it is a Bigfoot hotspot. Yeah. We're knocking on trees. We're hearing responses. I can't help but wonder if there's Bigfoot hunters somewhere else in the forest. That's probably <laughs> And like we're just talking to each other. Yeah. 75% of what's actually going on is just Bigfoot hunters <laughs> all, all the way across the lake from the other Bigfoot hunters who don't know that they're there and they're talking to each other. Right. But I mean, like, so, you know, using sounds to, like, alert other people have has been a thing that we, like, human beings have done for a long time. Absolutely. And kind of secretly have, you know, maybe there are sounds that they have that, that are ways to communicate, like, Oh, there's a bunch of people over here. Have you heard knocks in the wood before? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. Uh, we might even have some video footage that we can I drop have, into the episode. I have a really great uh, clip from, like I said, the last time we were at Salt Fork State Park, and we had just arrived at the cemetery area, which is where we investigate a lot, and, and there's the clearest tree knock. Like, it's just absolutely, it just rings right out of the woods. We'll all put our intentions into what we're doing tonight. Oh, did you just hear that? Yeah. I was recording. Bigfoot is a very sound-oriented cryptid, That's which I think true. is really interesting. Like hoots, hollers, yells, whoops. knocks, whoops. He's whistles. Got, yeah, Bigfoot has uh, all sorts of different kinds of sounds that have constantly been associated with them. God, you know it's funny thinking about that. I think Bigfoot is like the most sensory cryptid. Yeah. Whether it's like leaving impressions, yeah. smelling him, yeah, you, the sounds. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Like he's like Bigfoot is the most grounded and rooted of all the cryptids in our reality. Like people smell like you said, they smell, they get what they believe are hair samples. But yeah, there's there's a sense of like we're really sharing a lot of space with Bigfoot. So there is theory behind the idea of a tree knocker. Yeah. Um we should say first off, we're not professional Bigfoot hunters. Uh, we're not really outdoor kids. Anyone who no. gets a look at our skin tone, will you'll know. We're, we spend a lot of time in basements. Yeah. We're definitely not out in the woods following tracks and like, de you know, going, that's definitely Bigfoot scat. Definitely. Def <laughs> like, I, I would never be able to do that ever. I just like weird Bigfoot. And I feel yeah. like there's a lot of that. We're not going to talk too much about weird Bigfoot today. Yes. We will in an upcoming episode, I promise. We're going to focus more on fl the flesh and blood theory behind Bigfoot and, and mostly how you hunt Bigfoot, how yeah. most people would hunt Bigfoot who are into that sort of thing. And I feel like if we can do it, anyone can do <laughs> it. It is true. If we can do it, you can do it. And you should do it. Yeah. By the end of this episode, you'll have everything you need to know to go out and have your own Bigfoot hunting adventure. Yes. What's so funny, too, is, and we'll, we're we going to talk about a this a little bit in this episode, is intention seems to be what sets the tone when you go out yes. looking for Bigfoot. Like, Bigfoot knows what you know, your Bigfoot intention knows is. your heart, much like Jesus. Uh-huh. And Bigfoot is like, are you, you going to hurt me? Because <laughs> if you're going to hurt me, I'm not going to show up. <laughs> Bigfoot knows. Are you in possession of a haunted object? An antique spiritualist tool? Wreckage from a crashed UFO? The Newkirk Museum of the Paranormal wants to add it to their archives. Whether your strange item is causing you paranormal problems or is simply a supernaturally significant relic worthy of curation, we want to hear from you. For more information on our acquisition process, visit paramuseum.com. The reason we were with Jeff at all uh, is because we were shooting an episode of The World According to Jeff Goldblum. It's uh, it's in its second season. It's Emmy nominated. Yeah, it's we've a been, great we, show. We've been on an Emmy nominated television show. I know. That's bonk. So The World According to Jeff Goldblum is on Disney Plus. And every uh, episode, he looks at a different topic uh, from his perspective. Mm -hmm. So everything from like sneakers to he did an episode about like RVs and camping 
Um, this one was on monsters. Mm -hmm. So the idea was uh, he went and he hung out with uh, monster makers in California. And then he went and he hung out with people who hunt monsters. He hung out with us. They reached out to us because they wanted someone to take Jeff on a Bigfoot investigation. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, and of course. Said, what are we going to say? No. <laughs> yeah. We said, <laughs> absolutely. I put down all the pasta I'd been eating for a year. Yeah. And I went, oh, shit. <laughs> I guess I guess this is gonna be my my first for foray back into the world. Yes. After I've been a disheveled mess, <laughs> l like living indoors like a wild man. We all were. It's okay. It's true. Maybe to our own detriment. Maybe we're way too honest. Yeah. I, I was like, listen, just so you know, we're not normal Bigfoot hunters. The the Bigfoot hunting that you see on the internet, that's not really our bag. We're not going to be able to track anything. We're we're there to have fun. And like you mentioned at the beginning of the show, we're very, we're into the idea of weirder Bigfoot mm -hmm. theory. My initial thought is, do you think I'm going to wear a funny hat? <laughs> That's true. If you're Bigfoot a cryptozoologist, you have to wear a yeah, silly hat. At least like 80% of them wear some sort of a hat. And then also. <laughs> Not just a hat. It's a, a funny silly hat. hat. It's a funny hat. And then also, I am not going to like tr track animal prints or like, I can't even, I, you know what I mean? Like I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm like a, a path outdoor person on the woods. So I'm like, is there a trail? If there's a trail that's like, oh no, we would die. Level, we would die in the woods. Yeah. Like any uphill, I'm not doing it. Any, <laughs> any <laughs> the rocky terrain, I'm not doing it. Just give me a solid path that just goes straight without any inclines or declines. That's what I'm, that's what I'm, I excel at that. And so we literally were like talking these people out of using us because we were like, we are not, we don't know what scat looks like. We don't know, like, we know interesting ideas and we can talk about Bigfoot yes. from like a folklore perspective. And they, they said, that is why we want you guys. We get there. We get to set, and they take us out into the forest, and they uh, set us down on this big downed tree. Mm -hmm. Find out, actually, it's the same forest that they shot parts of Endor yeah. in Star Wars in mm -hmm. uh, Jurassic Park 2, starring it's, your friend Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, he's in that. Uh, <laughs> we're sitting there, and they're just like, just wait here. Yeah. Just wait here. You'll know what to do when it's time. Yeah. And we're like, what are you doing? So we're just sitting on like a 3,000 year old tree <laughs> in this woods where, in the woods where every tree is over 2,000 years old. Yeah. Just the most beautiful thing setting you possibly can imagine. And we're just <laughs> sitting there waiting, going, and all like, of a sudden, I don't know what's going to happen right now. All of a sudden we hear, oh, oh <laughs> like off in the distance. <laughs> I think I, I think I hear something. And we look over. And there's Jeff Goldblum <laughs> off in the distance being followed by a camera crew. He has this like super long, nice, I mean, he's so well manicured, mm -hmm. even at a distance. Mm -hmm. You can tell he's wearing Italian leather boots <laughs> in the forest. And he's just like looking around, looking at everything. And he's talking to the camera. And then I looked at Dana and I went, this is the weirdest <laughs> thing I've ever done. <laughs> he did. He actually did. It's insane. And we might as well have been looking at Bigfoot. Yeah. Jeff Goldblum is as much of a legend as Bigfoot <laughs> is. true. So seeing Jeff Goldblum just wander towards you through the woods. He approached us and he puts his, his two fingers to his temple and he looks right at us and he goes, the new Kirks. And then he just like gave us a hug. Mm -hmm. He smelled incredible, by the way. He did smell like, much better than Bigfoot. Rich wood. He mm -hmm. just he just smelled wonderful. He was incredibly tall, and uh, he knew everything about us. He'd watched yeah. he'd watched our show Hellier. He'd seen Hellier. He knew how we met. Mm -hmm. Like this guy did research on us, yeah. and it was bizarre to experience. It was like a deity walked <laughs> out of the woods <laughs> and said, "Like I've been following you, all the things that you've done," and you're just going, "Like how? What you've is done happening well, my right child. now?" Like yeah, like it was the weirdest. Mo it, it was wonderful, yeah. and he was immediately very warm and very friendly, and and all of the the kind of anxiety that you feel in those moments just sort of melted away, and then we had fun. Yeah. We went and had fun. The question I know that will be asked, the question that everybody always asks us about Jeff Goldblum is, is he really like that? Yes. And and the answer is yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Like all, I, all the time. That's just who he is. Yeah. The crew told us 
like the producer of the show who'd also produced a bunch of stuff with Anthony Bourdain. Like mm-hmm. this was a like a world class production, one of the best sets we've ever been on. Yeah. He sits us down before the show and he's like, "Listen, we're going to rely on you to keep this on track because he will sing, he will dance, he will talk to you about his favorite movies." You need to keep bringing it back to Bigfoot. Yeah. We're going to rely on you. And I'm like, what the fuck? you expect me to do this? He did all of those things. Yes. And more. Oh, he was constantly singing. Yeah, but he always brings it back to the point. You know what I mean? Like yeah. sometimes you just have to remind him. But, you know, he is he's a incredibly uh sprightly energy. He has yes. he seems like a fairy. Like he seems like a fairy. Oh no no. He, I think he, I think he's an ultra terrestrial. He also seems a bit like he an matches every description of the ultra terrestrials. Yeah. He's, he's tan, tall. he's handsome. That's he doesn't true. really seem to understand how to communicate with a human. He's though. got Indrid Cold energy. He does. He really does. That's very true. If anyone's an alien, it's Jeff Goldblum. It's Jeff Goldblum. And he's a wonderful alien. Mm-hmm. So we spent a couple days with him in the Redwoods looking for Bigfoot. We taught him how to do tree knocks. We, we did. We taught him how to do Bigfoot howls. Mm-hmm. We taught him how to use different types of bait. Yeah. Uh, and then we just talked about what we thought Bigfoot was and why we're so interested in Bigfoot. It was great. Uh, initially, the, the first day, we really focused on play and kind of being silly. And that's part of what, you know, looking for Bigfoot is. It's about getting out of your own head playing and having fun and that was sort of what the first day was all about so like you said it was a lot of hoots a lot of tree knocking a lot of exploring a lot of kind of just getting into that mindset of playfulness so f- weird man i still can't believe it ha- it just doesn't feel real but i imagine that's how most people feel after they've seen bigfoot and recorded yeah. a bunch of weird noises uh-huh. in the woods and he made a bunch of weird noises in the woods <laughs> he, he did <laughs> <laughs> they sounded more like hootie hoo <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> he did that. He did that a couple times. Yeah. He also asked if we were actors. He did. He said that we should be if we aren't. He was like, are you actors? And we were like, no, no, we're terrible. <laughs> He's like, oh, you should be. You should be. be. You should. And we were like, I think. Maybe. Like, have your people call our people. <laughs> yeah. Our people are us. <laughs> <laughs> have your people just phone us. <laughs> well, it was a great shoot all together. Like, it was one of the best shoots that we've ever done. The set was incredible. Working with National Geographic. Yeah. (laughs) How many paranormal investigators ever get to work with National Geographic? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, was they were very, and I think this one came directly from the mouse, they were very adamant that we don't talk about Bigfoot as if it's a fact. Yeah, which I kind of liked, yeah. actually. I don't think that we, you know, like, it seemed to come pretty naturally. Like, you know, and and again, because of that, it allowed us to have a lot of interesting conversations about folklore and the importance of, of myth and legend kind of existing. Right. So it was, it was a nice thing to, you know, be able to speculate a lot, which I thought was kind of fun. Highly recommend. Go Bigfoot hunting with Jeff Goldblum. If you ever get the opportunity, go do it. Or just go look for Bigfoot. What was your favorite moment of hanging out with Jeff? I mean, he just constantly made fun of Tom Cruise. Oh, which he I thought did. Was very funny. <laughs> he definitely. And they put it in the episode. I could not times. believe it. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like that was really fun. I, it, truly, like some of my favorite moments were because it was such a big um, crew, there was a lot of downtime. So just getting to like just stand around with Jeff Goldblum and talk to yeah. him about, you know, conspiracy theories and, and all that kind of like he was. Because this was right before the last election. Yeah. And, and he, he was very like we talked about how prevalent conspiracy theories are in the paranormal community and just how, you know, hurt, hurtful they are and how d- destructive they can be. And we had these like very interesting philosophical, philosophical conversations with him. Yeah. My favorite was getting him to smell the Bigfoot pheromones. Oh, that also. So one of the other tools that are are used quite often in Bigfoot hunting these Uh days, they've been used very successfully on uh, the Skookum expedition. That's how they got the Skookum cast, which is allegedly a Bigfoot's posterior. Also the sound you make when you smell the... (laughs) You scook them out of your freaking mouth holes. It's disgusting. There is. Vomit scook them out of your face, every hole in your face. Hold on. Guess what I have handy? I have a bottle of Can these I smell it Sasquatch through pheromones. the thing? Don't you dare open it. No, Don't. I'm opening no, it. No, let me smell it Hold through on. it. Oh, my 
It's making my eyes water, and it's it's still in the can. It's still closed. It's still in the can. So No, don't touch it. No, I'm just going to show people. So do you want to explain what this is? That's what I'm trying to do. Oh, God, it's so disruptive because it stinks so bad. So these these are pheromone chips. These were created by uh, a laboratory out in Duluth. It's Osmic Research Company. Which is Osmic Research? Osmic Research. That's not a real research company. It sounds like a Spider-Man You're going to get us in trouble. They're absolutely a real company. And there's real science that's involved in these. Okay. So these... Sorry, sorry. Shout out Osmic Research. Shout out Osmic Research. Uh, You can go to SasquatchPheromone.com if you'd like to order your own... These, God, they f-ing smell bad. They're, they're what they're called is impregnated bait chips. Okay. So they typically are used by deer hunters. These orange chips, and you hang them uh, up upwind, and then you just sit and wait. These have great ape pheromones mixed with human pheromones, and that's about as close as they could get to what a Bigfoot or Sasquatch is supposed to be. They, it just smells like all the most disgusting. It's like butt and cheese and feet and <laughs> foot locker and balls and f- I don't even know. It's like the grossest, nastiest. It smells stinkiest, disgusting smell. Like Bigfoot's grundle. It stinks. It's what's pretty- a grundle? <laughs> a, I, a, gr- a grundle's like your taint. Oh. It's like it's, it's, you know between your between your b hole. Yeah. In your sack. It's terrible. <laughs> they this, disgusting. This, this smell it's freaking horrible. gross. It's so gross. So but they but they work. Allegedly. They, I mean, we've used them before. I did for charity uh, a couple years ago during COVID. I told people in the museum. Yeah. If you're not a museum member, patreon.com slash paramuseum. Join our museum. Join the museum. It's how we can get to weekly episodes. Yes, that's also true. If you want weekly episodes, we, uh, I said, listen, because somebody told me they're like, I'll put, I'll give you ten dollars to put that in your mouth, and I was like, ten dollars. I said, you know what? Tell you what, if you raise a thousand dollars together for my favorite charity, Malika, I will put one in my mouth. The smell. And the to come museum here. members raised seven grand. They did. So I, I put a bigfoot suit on and I put it in my mouth and it was the worst sixty seconds of my life. I don't think you made it the full sixty seconds. Probably not. It's I don't really horrible. You. And you know the weird part? This is the worst part about this. I think it did something to me. It probably because did. Because after putting them in my mouth for I'm not joking, a year. Yeah. When I sweat, I thought I smelled the same stuff. <laughs> It probably God. changed your DNA. Maybe. I still, once in a while, feel like I smell, like if I don't shower in a day or two, Ugh. I feel like I smell the Sasquatch pheromones. But see, what I don't understand is like, are would that not be like an aggressive smell? Would that not send Bigfoot running? Well, I think it's supposed to be a horny smell. Oh. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what the pheromones are for. Gross. So like you put these out, you might have a, a, a sexually aroused Sasquatch coming your way. All right, let me... Put it, no, put it oh, back oh, in the thing. Oh, be I'm careful. not opening <laughs> it. Do not open that jar. I'm not going to open it. When I, for the record, the the shot of you um, with a geyser of Listerine <laughs> yeah, sh- after you smelled it is Brain. still the profile picture for you in my phone. No, really? Yeah. Just spraying. It's so funny. And he's in a Bigfoot costume <laughs> and it's just. <laughs> yeah, I was wearing a geyser trying to recover. Wait, smell my breath. Smell my breath. I can't smell my breath. I want you to smell it. Smell it. <laughs> God, they, they I don't know hands. if this is like a rite of passage for other people that come to your house, but you made me smell them. And That's true. We, we should have, put, we'll put the clip in of, of Connor right. smelling it. Yeah, just before this was terrible. Here. Right out of the gate with just the plastic off. What are this what kind of fragrances? What kind of notes are we getting here? We're already getting like Backed up sewer line kind of notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a little bit, It's but it's musky. Like oh, yeah. It is very musky. It's like swamp sewer line. Yeah. Oh, God. Here he goes. That's that's you and and uh, your ancient ancestors. That's your that's your ape cousins. <laughs> I'm so nervous. <laughs> oh, no. You got to take one big, deep whiff, though. Make it worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha 
So there you go. That's uh, that's Connor's experience. Well, we do have a new person in the studio today. Everyone say hi to Keelan. Hi, Keelan. Hi, Keelan. <laughs> hi, Keelan. <laughs> Connor only has so many hands. So Keelan's been helping with research for these episodes. And you know what? No. We really should research these Sasquatch pheromones. Listen, Connor went full, right into the jar, <laughs> full what? nose. I'm also going to give you this because you're going to. It's really bad. And so, yeah, I opened it and I did like a, like a, and it went up there and it was up there for a few days. So don't do that no. if you're going to do this. I'm going to treat it like I'm in But you can kind of, why don't you just uncap it? Make it descriptive. The audience God. needs to know. Also, before you do this, Keelan, can you let everyone know this is not a hazing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it? Yeah, I don't yeah, know. It might be. It, it kind of feels like it. Great idea. <laughs> also, this is my first episode. <laughs> That's the first Sorry, thing she's Keelan. Done. Welcome Sorry, Keelan. to Weird HQ. I feel like I can already smell it. Oh, I'm sure you <laughs> can. definitely can. I There's a reason smell. we have it okay. double bagged. Here it goes. The cap is coming off. All right, yeah. You want to do a description? Yeah. Keelan's twisting the cap it's like off. A bomb. <laughs> yeah, come on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're not supposed to open those indoors. <laughs> oh, oh no, the whole side of the studio is gonna spit. It's over here. All right, so so come on, give, back. put it back. <laughs> There's like an element of like rotten egg to it. Like yep. I feel like it hit me in the back of the throat. Uh -huh. I mean, he's not called the skunk ape for nothing. <laughs> There's like Don't a walk it over here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. That way. No. There's like a, a gross almost like sweetness to it. Yeah. Ooh, yes. The smell that always hits me first, and it's like the only thing that, because I don't do it for very long, is just feet. feet. I just smell mm, stinky, yeah. stinky yeah. feet. Really stinky feet. Really gross feet. <laughs> Connor's looking rough. <laughs> You're a little pale now, Connor. You're a little... My nose is running. <laughs> so the sniffs that are... At... I described if... it as dark yellow. <laughs> That's what it would smell that... like. It smells like dark yellow. That, I would agree with that. On And if I had done a sniff like yours, I there would be vom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, dude. You made Jeff Goldblum smell these too, right? Oh, yes. it was great. Yeah. It was amazing. This is the, one of the worst things he's ever smelled, he said. Yeah, he... He was uh, cautious. He was nervous about smelling it. Well, you know, you just hand some guy something and you're like, hey, yeah. smell this. Well, the problem <laughs> was also you took the lid off and we were, he was a little downwind from the oh, jar right. that was open. So the smell was already drifting over to him. And I think right. he like fully knew what it was he was in for. <laughs> but he did it like a champ. He did. They he did use that clip it. in, the, they in did. the episode. It was great. It's a bad smell. It's yeah. so bad. Oh my um, God. Round of applause. Thank you, Thank Keelan. Thank you, Keelan. Bravo. Nice work. Nice work. Thank you. Part of the gang now. <laughs> Officially. Officially. <laughs> what's a what's a Bigfoot call, Dana? Woohoo! <laughs> That's a bad one. Well, I meant for you to describe what oh, they are, oh. but you can do it too. <laughs> uh, Bigfoot vocalizations are, there's lots of different kinds, but usually it's hoots, it's hollers, it's screams, and they, uh, they come in all different tones and shapes and sizes. <laughs> As you can tell, the one that I just did is a little pip squeak. I mean, that kind of sounded like Mario. Little, <laughs> Yahoo! Yahoo! Mario. Wahoo! Um, yeah, that that was a little pip squeak, Bigfoot howl. You can do them however you want. Bigfoot vocalizations are a very common thing. We've used them uh, when we've been Bigfoot hunting with the guys from Finding Bigfoot. We've done it when we were with Jeff Goldblum. We taught him how to do it. Um, he wasn't very good at it. No. I mean, he was I don't think he took it very no, seriously. <laughs> he definitely didn't. He really leaned into that play thing, which, which you know, do your That's thing. That's fine. That's great. Yeah. This is this is one of mine. No. Oh, wait. 
I'm not. Warning. No, I'm. I'm backing up. Warning. I'm backing up. I'm backing up. Don't audio worry. warning for all your cats and dogs. It, this, and here's the weird friends. thing about Bigfoot calls. They do freak other animals out a they lot. They do. Greg's is also very, very loud. If you have a Bigfoot in your home, make yeah. sure they're away because this might agitate them. That's yeah. true. Take your headphones off. <laughs> Here we go. Whoop! Whoop! <laughs> there you go. That's my Bigfoot call. Okay. Bobo said it was okay. He said it was pretty good. Sure. There's people who have somehow trained themselves to do these like really crazy whoops where they go whoop, whoop. <laughs> That's another one. Did you just did you just do it? <laughs> I guess I did. <laughs> people have trained themselves for years <laughs> to be able to do this. Greg just discovered his one true talent. <laughs> just, just did it. <laughs> immediately being able to do Bigfoot calls. Keelan, do you have any? Um. Wahoo. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Luigi? Yeah. <laughs> we have Mario and Luigi in the oh studio. God. What about you, Connor? You've heard some. Yep. You, you've spent a lot of time listening to some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like it's that one. It's just a man screaming. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> It's just a terrified man screaming. <laughs> You'd hate to hear that in the woods. I <laughs> know. Yep. Friggin so it works. <laughs> yeah, I would run the other direction if I heard <laughs> that in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I do the call first to get the other Bigfoot hunters away from us. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> yes. Then the you guys can one. step in. So the question is, mm -hmm. where in the world did people get the idea to do Bigfoot calls? Where did these noises come from and why are they so certain that that's what Bigfoot sounds like? The coked out 70s, baby. <laughs> that That's is where it came true. from. <laughs> Back in the 70s, there was a five-year period, uh, around five years, 1971 to I think 1975, where a group of guys went out into the Sierra Nevada mountains and they started to hear these really strange screams. Yeah. They tried to do them back. They would get vocalizations back to them and they brought out recorders and they recorded what is now known as the sierra sounds i've listened to them so many times and they still freak me out they sound so weird there's been they've been picked apart and and looked at by so many different people but they are truly one of the creepiest recordings of an alleged uh group of sasquatch actually there's a lot of history around these sounds yeah they're still to this day they're they're basically if if the patterson gimlin footage is the definitive video footage of yes. Bigfoot. The Sierra Sounds is the definitive audio of Bigfoot. And they are very unsettling. So in August of 1971, mm -hmm. uh, it was Ron Moorhead, Al Berry, and Warren Johnson. These guys were headed out to a deer hunting camp that mm -hmm. had been passed down through the family for years and years. They were just going to hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys were not Bigfoot hunters. They were just outdoorsmen. They went to this camp. It was an eight or nine mile hike. It was not an easy place to get to. Mm -hmm. And it was a secret place. Uh, they had really good hunting there and they did, just didn't tell anyone where this place was. The They didn't have a cabin or anything. It was just a lean-to. Mm -hmm. So it's a tree, basically, with a bunch of logs and, and sticks and everything uh, leaned to it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where they stayed. That's where they slept. They had a little place where they would tie their horses up. They had an outdoor fireplace where they could cook. And they even had a little uh, toilet. They had a hole in the ground, but they had an actual like toilet with a lid. Mm -hmm. um, this place was uh, middle of nowhere. Yeah. So they're just going out there to hang out, be they were, in nature. I think they were actually going out to check on the camp and make sure that it was set up for the start of hunting season. I okay. don't even think it was quite hunting season okay. yet. So they're much like all great Bigfoot moments in history, it begins accidentally. Accidentally. With the no intention of bumping into a mythological creature nope. whatsoever. No interest in Bigfoot that anyone knows about. They're just hunters. Okay. There's a picture of it too we have. Oh yeah, there we go. If you're listening to the audio version of the podcast, uh, there's a great photo of it if you look it up um it's on ron moorhead's site i believe it's so funny because f for years and years i thought that it was like up in the trees no 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 it's on I, the ground i visualized it like way up in the trees but yeah it's like right on ground level 
It's just, just a bunch of logs leaned up against a little cluster you know what, of trees. Do you know what it looks like? Huh? A fort. <laughs> it looks like a kid's fort. <laughs> this is a man fort. It's a. I mean, it's an adult fort, but yeah, it looks <laughs> definitely looks like a fort that I built when I was like 12 years old. It really does. <laughs> Which is interesting, right? Because again, if play is a sense of it, you know what I For mean? For sure. Like, there's something childlike and fun about it. It's. It seems like a fort. So this group of guys, they're going out to their fort nine miles out mm-hmm. into the Sierra Nevada mountains. Mm-hmm. And when they get out there, they start to hear these blood curdling vocalizations. Yeah. The likes of which they've never heard before. Yeah. You have to keep in mind, these guys are hunters. They we're made fun of a lot. Other Bigfoot hunters are made fun of a lot because a lot of the things that you hear in the woods are just misidentifications sure. of animals that anyone who's an outdoorsman knows like, these guys are yelling at owls. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes, I know exactly what you mean. Some people take uh, great offense to that and they say, well, Bigfoot uh, masks itself as an owl in order sure. to talk. Like we've heard coyotes and owls and yada, yada. These are not like that at all. Yeah. Whatever these are, are not an animal that anyone knew about at the time. Yeah. And also a, a important thing to say is we have a group of people who are pretty well versed with what the woods sound like. Yes. Like they're, they are people who spend obviously enough time that hiking nine miles up the up a mountain in the middle of nowhere isn't really a big deal. They are outdoorsy people. They know what coyotes sound like they know what foxes sound like they know what mountain lions sound they know the sounds of the woods yes and for them to hear these sounds and not know what the f- <laughs> they were hearing right. has to be i mean even more credibility to the sounds themselves because sure. if it if it was something crazy that they had never heard before then that's a big thing. If it was me, I'm in the woods and I'm every sound I hear. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm right. freaking out. But like, if you're somebody who is very comfortable in the woods, specifically at night in the middle of nowhere, and you hear these sounds and you don't recognize them, that's kind of interesting to me. Well, they didn't recognize them. <laughs> yeah. And over the course of the next year, they heard these vocalizations quite a bit. Yeah. In fact, they seemed to get more aggressive the more that they went back. Yeah. They started sounding scarier, and then they started finding prints. They found Bigfoot prints. Yeah, there's photographs of those prints, and they're really interesting because they are very big. The toes are very splayed apart as if, you know, feet that essentially would hold up a very large creature and i think that they're really fascinating they're, they're very different than like the patty patterson gimlin footprint for instance right where they're all together yeah they at this point something really interesting happens at least it's interesting to me uh al barry decides he's going to go back out to the camp in 1973 with yeah. the explicit purpose of recording these sounds yeah, Al Not- Barry, bravest human being on the planet, <laughs> hears these sounds and goes, I'm going back. He's not there to hunt, so he hikes way out back to the camp. Yeah. And he sits there and he tries everything he can to capture these sounds. And they don't show up. And he was there for an extended period of time. It wasn't just like a couple of days. He was there for a while and did not capture anything. So, but that's very interesting because what does that say? The first time... No, that intention of just going out, having fun and enjoying yourself. The second time there was an intention there of like, I'm going to capture these sounds. I'm going to get them on. And as, it was as if, you know, the Bigfoot in the area were like. Like they knew. Yeah, they could sense it. Uh-huh. Like an animal. So he spends most of the summer trying to get these sounds. Doesn't get them. In fact, the sounds that everyone is familiar with, the Sierra sounds themselves, yes. aren't captured until the next year. 1974 is when year. Ron Moorhead captures these sounds on a portable tape recorder Mm -hmm. and we actually have a model of that tape recorder here on the desk these stinky tape recorders that we have (laughs) it's next to us it's what smells like a basement yeah they set up these recorders Mm -hmm. and they actually capture the sounds and they are stunning yeah these sounds changed bigfoot hunting forever the same way the patterson gimlin film did yeah so it's 1974 Everybody's got a good mustache. Everybody's got a mullet. I th- I think they were either in their lean-to or out of it, but they were about 10 feet away from the microphone yeah. that was hanging from the front of the lean-to. They start to hear one of the creatures slamming the toilet lid yeah, they, on their toilet. They actually saw this creature in that area as it was sort of slamming. And when you listen to the recording, 
I didn't realize this at first because I thought it was tree knocking, but it's the sound of the lid of the toilet being <laughs> right. lifted up and smacked down multiple times. Why in the world aren't Bigfoot hunters taking toilet seats out in the woods with them? <laughs> I mean, like you would think at this point, like they're, they, but see what's cool and interesting about that is again, if this is all true, that means that there's some awareness of how this thing works and the sound and there, there's like a curiosity. And I think that it, this moment specifically was described as being sort of playful. Like there was a sense right. of playfulness that was happening at this right. point. And that they can use thumbs. Yeah, that they can, that exactly. They yes. have the dexter because a bear's not doing that. Yeah, no At way. least not easily. Yeah. So. Yeah. We so. should, um, do you want to play a little clip of what they heard? Yeah. <laughs> so scary. <laughs> so that's them returning the sounds. That's the toilet seat. So scary. It's listening to them. Banging the toilet seat lid. At this point, I think they're 50 yards away. Mm -hmm. Really cool vocalizations. That's the famous. <laughs> what you're hearing right here is what Bigfoot hunters are still doing today yeah. because of this audio. And I mean, that's like an example of the most incredibly ideal situation for a lot of Bigfoot investigators is to not only hear sounds, but to have what is pretty amazing communication like there's what's happening there is whatever that is is communicating directly back with the people making sounds and they're repeating what they're hearing and the the creatures repeating it back to them and there's like there's absolutely a sense of awareness that there are two different groups of uh beings here communicating with each other it's pretty crazy it's amazing there are those moments where they're talking so quickly that like the audio is like oh, and and it's indistinguishable what is going on mm -hmm. like what how so many noises come out of this creature's mouth so fast and then there's all this audio analysis about how and we'll link to the to the videos but yeah it was so cool we had a lot of fun watching where it's like doesn't make sense how it goes so low and so high so quickly mm -hmm. um there's too many octaves being covered uh, it's a it's really wild analysis to try to figure out what this is i mean according to everyone who's analyzed the audio it is not like a normal person's voice. It, it maybe yeah. could be a trained singer, like Mariah Carey. <laughs> yeah, someone can who carry can five hit. octaves uh, like that. Yeah, exactly. And whoever or whatever is making this noise, it's speaking so quickly and so fluently in whatever it's saying. And you can hear the difference between whoever that is or whatever that is. It's going like, whatever mm -hmm. they're sounding like. And the guy's trying to imitate it. Yeah. Because they sound like they're people who are trying to imitate something yes. that they have never heard before. Uh-huh. There's another interesting thing that we uh, learned from that night, and it's something that still persists to this day as far as Bigfoot investigations go. But when they tried to turn the cassette, cassette tape over, they turned a flashlight on. Oh, yeah, and they went... And then Goodbye. every all sound stopped. And yeah. so one of the other things you'll notice a lot of Bigfoot investigators, more serious Bigfoot investigators will do is they will avoid using, using flashlights. They often try to cover their, their lights with red <laughs> We film. got yelled at. Yeah. <laughs> we got yelled at on Finding Bigfoot because we had kept f fiddling with our headlamps. Yeah. And they had to have special headlamps that have only red light on mm -hmm. them because Bigfoot will be scared off by regular light. Yeah. Meanwhile, Matt Moneymaker is standing <laughs> 10 feet away puffing on a Vaping. vape pen with like yeah. churro flavored vape. Maybe Bigfoot likes <laughs> so vapes. Like, we're just like, okay, but, whatever. I mean, what I think is cool about that is we sort of have this this moment, this like linchpin moment where this this behavior, this this belief that Bigfoot hunters still to this day adhere to has, you know, its roots in also in this moment. So yeah. we've got vocalizations. There are so many things that were learned and then have been repeated for the past 50 years from this specific series of investigations or, yeah. or recordings just in general. I mean, I, I keep saying it, but if you can 
go back, you can point to really two things that have have uh, affected Bigfoot hunters forever. Mm -hmm. It's the Patterson Gimlin film and it's the Sierra Sounds. Yeah, for sure. And the Sierra Sounds weren't just limited to the clip that we just listened to. There are whoops, there are howls, there are whistles. Yeah. Um, at there, one point they even said they heard something that sounded like a tuning fork. Yeah. Which I think that, is interesting. That was a weirder detail that right. I had never heard before. But yeah, it was like a giant tuning fork had been rung and they could hear it kind of emanating in the woods. These things have been around for a long time. Um, back in the the 70s, there was a, a 45 record that was put out. We can show an image of it. We have it in the collection. And it is uh, mostly Al Berry's sounds, his recordings, I believe. And those uh, that record is, is incredibly rare, but it's the first time that those sounds were made public, the mm -hmm. first time that they were out. There have been numerous different releases. There was one uh, album that came out not too long ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, that was Jonathan Frakes okay. uh, narrating them. So Jonathan Frakes, he's got his hands in all kinds of weird stuff. I have no idea who that is. <laughs> it's like Riker? It's Commander Riker. Oh. Dude. <laughs> I've never watched an episode. Uh, uh, is it Star Wars? Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know who it is. You're, Keelan, our resident Star Trek fan uh, back sorry, there, is a Keelan. shame. I'm sorry, so Keelan. Which, uh, which Star Trek was he on? He was on Next Gen. Next Generation. That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah. Here's if you want me to tell you how I know Jonathan Frakes is because he narrated Alien Autopsy for Fox. Oh, oh, that guy! I know exactly who you're talking about. He was the host, the beard guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. beard guy, beard right. guy, the beard guy, beard yeah. guy. Shout out, beard guy. You've seen that great uh, compilation from yeah. Fact or Fiction, yes. where yeah. he's like, he's like asking you questions uh -huh. and they slow him down a little bit, yes. just so he sounds like he's a drunk guy. Uh huh. I mean, there were so, but there were so many things that happened that often get overlooked because we are so enamored with the sounds themselves. But Bigfoot was gifting them things. It, like oh, yeah. They were finding pine cones in old uh, like frying pans. Like right. Big, big piles of pine cones. They saw Bigfoot. They did. He was very quick. Uh, so they, they didn't really get a really great uh, look at him until later. They started to get better looks at him. But every time they would try and set up a camera, like a sneaky camera... Mm -hmm nothing would show up. It's yeah. like they were too clever for them to get a picture. So we have this audio. We have stuff that they've left them. We have uh, prints. Interesting splayed toad prints. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the prints were, they were happening so much that Ron Moore had admitted that one time he even wiped one off of the trail yeah. because he didn't want anybody else to find out where their camp was. Yeah, it makes sense. So lots of evidence that Tons was captured there. And the sounds... They were so again. Jonathan Frakes was was narrating one of the audio releases of this thing, so that shows you how culturally significant these things were. Mm -hmm. They because they were so culturally significant, they were sent off for different testing. Like yeah. people were actual audio experts were looking at this stuff. They had linguists. I think there were linguists also who thought that they, what they were hearing were like two creatures at certain points communicating with each other. Potentially even a juvenile too. Yeah, yeah, and you can hear at one point what well, sounds like. it's It sounds further away. If you look at the, the photo or the drawing of their camp, you can see that there was a creek that was sort of, you know, further, further away from where they had set up their camp. And in the recording, when they capture the sound of what they believe is the juvenile, the younger Bigfoot, it's it's kind of making like sweet sound. Like it's very sweet sounding yeah. and, and it's by the woods and it's you can tell it's further off as if they sort of went safer for you to hang out here. We're going to go and mess with these people. Just go, you know, stay over here by the creek. The uh, one of the linguists uh, was a retired Navy guy named Scott Nelson. Mm -hmm. Scott Nelson uh, claims that there's actual uh, evidence that there's a lang real language happening there, yeah. but that it. It's not human speech. It yeah. actually, it's outside the realm of human speech. I think I remember him and Ron on a very old episode of Coast to Coast with yeah, Art Bell. Yeah, I think you're and right. And they broke it all down. It was really interesting back in the day. Uh, there's another, uh, an interpreter, Nancy Logan, that said the noises also include vocalizations made with what sounds like parts of their vocal tract that native English speakers would have tremendous trouble in learning. Interesting. You can hear it when they try and replicate it. Yeah. They they sound like uh they sound like some dude from the Midwest trying to imitate French. Bonsoir. <laughs> oh, they kind of do. Don't they? Yeah. 
<laughs> and that's the whole thing is like you have to you to put on the skeptic hat for a second. Like you have to think like, oh, how did these guys fake this? Right. <laughs> right. Because the the wonderful thing about these old fashioned recordings is that it's just straight onto a tape. Yeah. There's not digital manipulation happening, and so they would have had to have like really kind of faked it in the moment unless right. they recorded something in advance and played it to the other recorder. But the thing is, is like if they're faking this, they have incredible masterful vocal capacity mm-hmm. right to do this in the middle of the woods and bizarre linguist uh, ling- linguistic capabilities that are like beyond human lung capacity and stuff like that like it's very cool oh yeah that was um, the other thing uh some of the people who were researching this said that whatever was making the sounds had to have a bigger lung capacity than a human being mm-hmm. because of the the projection on these things but it is funny to imagine it's just them doing it, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. <laughs> just put that image in your head for a second. There's just, just this guy out there dudes. going, what? Dudes in the 70s. Yeah. Just out there. It was the 70s. It was the 70s, baby. <laughs> Who knows what they were getting up to all out there? All friggin' <laughs> all coked up, just going, let's make some Bigfoot sounds, boys. <laughs> <laughs> we're not saying that they are cocaine no, users. No, I'm just, I'm saying, I'm generalizing in terms of the 70s, just in, in general. Yes. Allegedly, a lot of people were doing cocaine Allegedly. in the 70s. I mean, you hear tell of what it was like in the 70s, you know? The sounds started to go away mm-hmm. when one of the campers threatened to shoot one of the entities. And yeah. then they started to go away and they went away for good after they killed a bear. Yeah, I mean, I don't really blame them. Like they're they killed a bear that was coming into their camp. It was it was eating, you know, their food and just kind of causing some trouble. But the bear is doing the exact same thing that Bigfoot is doing. Right. It's coming into their camp. I mean, at certain points they would come back to camp and find backpacks opened and loaves of bread had been taken. Like, literally the bread had been taken out of the bag and it was missing and then the bag was left behind. But, like, imagine if you were a creature and you're kind of aware of these people and, and at this up to this point, you kind of have a good relationship with them and then suddenly you see them kill an oh, animal yeah. that's doing the exact same thing that you're doing. Yeah. You're going to be scared and you're not going to want to go back and you're not going to want to communicate with them. Like... They absolutely totally make sense that Bigfoot would be like, nah, I'm good. I'm out. Yeah. I'm not dealing with these guys anymore. And that's pretty well where the Sierra so- uh, Sound Saga ends. Yeah. After they kill the bear, they regretted it. Yeah. They wish they hadn't done it. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like that finally made Bigfoot go, I don't know if I want to hang out with these guys anymore. Understandably. Ron Moorhead still goes out to the camp. Uh, he, I think he was out there not too long ago. There's still weird stuff that happens out there. Ron, uh, he does lots of different interviews. It's very easy to find some of these interviews, and you can listen to him and his opinion on things. It's You can tell that Ron has a hard time trying to rationalize what happened to him out there. Yeah. Um, you know, back in the day, I think Ron was a flesh-and-blood Bigfoot guy. Sure. But now, like, he has a new book that just came out called Quantum Bigfoot. Yeah, so he's getting into the weirder spaces. Yeah. I mean, it it tends to happen like part of, you know, the interesting thing about Bigfoot is so often you find that there is really a line drawn in the sand between flesh and blood Bigfoot investigators and then the weirder stories. Oh, they typically do not get along. No. And and do you you remember the guy at Ohio, the Ohio Bigfoot conference at Salt Fork? How could I forget? (laughs) You mean the man who (laughs) farted while making a Bigfoot sound after mocking us? (laughs) did it was so funny because we were we were there not as as, as <laughs> attend or guests we were just there no we were just creeping because around. we were interested in the bigfoot yeah stuff and uh we show up in this guy silly hat yeah he definitely had a silly hat on all tan uh-huh and he's talking to us outside and he goes uh what did he say? He was like, oh, yeah, you know, what do you guys think about Bigfoot? And I was we, like, well, you know, we're kind of got, we got weird ideas about Bigfoot. I was like, it might be a thought form. Yeah, I think you literally said to him, which is kind of your go-to, is like, <laughs> Bigfoot is a ghost. And he was yes. like, eh, I don't deal with any of that woo-woo. And then he went, whoo, and literally just like. Big old fart. Just bombed. He bombed <laughs> and then he, everybody. And then he walked away. But he didn't say, he didn't acknowledge it. Yeah. Because it was mid-call. Like it happened mid-call. He put too much force in his diaphragm and it just like blasted out the other end. Ass blasters. 
I mean, you know, that's a, a great example, though, of like what happens is like you'll get a lot of people who are not really interested in any of Big- the weirder things, which suck because there's so many stories that are bizarre that happen around Bigfoot sightings. And a lot of Bigfoot investigators toss that stuff out. Bigfoot uh, is definitely not a ghost, but here's how you smack the tree with a big yeah. stick to call the monkey man. His name is Big Fart. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I'm going to refer to him from now on. That guy's big fart. Big fart. <laughs> big. I love that he just walked away. He just, he just walked away. Like, there's no way you can come back. No, from that. no. So you you know leave. what's weird? We can keep having that issue where people are <laughs> farting on us. Yeah. You know what's funny? <laughs> Yours was uh, in your face, and I was sitting on the ground. Oh, and so that him. was in I your was face. Directly downwind from big fart, and he got me. <laughs> he tagged me. <laughs> You hang around weirdos long enough, you're going to get farted on. There's apparently we a lot of stomach issues <laughs> for people into weird stuff. Just don't care. Fart freely, friends. Well, they experience weird stuff. Uh, they still experience weird stuff out at the campsite. Yeah. Ron uh, still knows where it is. Still, I, I think to me, one of the, the most fascinating things is the fact that he's still not revealed the the location of that camp i also think that that lends a lot of credibility I do too. to him because uh, right now he could get a travel channel show immediately, immediately yeah just by letting them know where uh, the camp he could is. get any number of massive networks would absolutely would immediately give him a tv show right out of the gate just to be able to shoot there so uh that's interesting to me and it's kind of you know what i and love they've never that? captured him again no that's the other weird thing yeah. Those are still the gold standard in Bigfoot vocalizations, yeah. and they're from the 70s. Yeah, there's there's not been, I mean, there's a lot of interesting Bigfoot vocalizations, but there's never been anything quite as mesmerizing no. and terrifying no. as the Sierra sounds. So do you think that uh, Jeff Goldblum walked away from our Bigfoot hunt believing in Sasquatch? No. <laughs> He I definitely did, he did not. Did, no. <laughs> no. Do you think Jeff Goldblum calls me his friend Dana Newkirk? No. No. That's... Do you think Jeff Goldblum will watch this? He watched your other stuff. Jeff Goldblum, if you watch this, we love you. We love you. Thank you for allowing us to spend some time with you yeah. and to get a little bit of your magic and your DNA. <laughs> we, what? We, well... I do have a water bottle that he drank out of that he put in it's my true. backpack, and I still have. It's actually, hang on, look. Oh my <laughs> god! It. Oh my god! He has it in a box. Look what the box Labeled is. <laughs> Gold bloom samples. <laughs> That's actually very. We're gonna clone your ass, Jeff. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by the Newkirk Museum of the Paranormal Membership Program. Become a museum member and take part in live paranormal investigations. Receive Dana's Magic of the Month subscription box, access in-depth artifact case files, and gain access to hundreds of hours of exclusive content available only to members. To become a member, visit patreon.com slash paramuseum. All right, so we will get into a little bit of weirdness in this episode. Yeah. Again, this is our flesh and blood Bigfoot episode. We'll talk about weirder stuff later, but you've probably noticed by now that the Squatch Knocker has a strange symbol carved on it. That is a sigil. It's a magic seal. The point of this was to turn this from a mundane baseball bat used to call Bigfoot to a magic wand charged by the equally magical Jeff Goldblum. There's a lot of different ways you can make sigils. There's a lot of, uh, you know, conversation around the creation of sigils. A lot of people will come up with a power word and they will remove the vowels from right. that word and then use what's left over and make it into this incredible shape. So uh, using your imagination, creating a shape from the letters that are left over from your power word and creating a sigil, essentially yeah. an, a imbued image that has everything to do with the intention that you're setting for it. Uh, that's the the sigil creation mesh method that was popularized by a guy by the name of uh, Austin Osmond Spare. He was a, a magician, a ritual magician, and an artist, and he often combined the two. Uh, he came up with the idea of taking your whatever phrase it was, removing the vowels, and then you jumble them all together. And then uh, typically the way that you would cast the sigil 
uh, put it into your subconscious in order to send it out to the universe is you would do some kind of a thing where it would be burned into your brain. Uh, chaos magicians were the ones who went, oh, well, I'm just going to jerk off. <laughs> and then at the moment of my of climax, I will look at the sigil, and then you destroy it. And the idea is often to try and forget the original intention. Yeah, and then you don't want to overthink it. Just absolutely. let it happen. Get out of the way. But there's other ways. Like there are, there are literally ritual magicians who will bungee jump. Yeah. And stare at the sigil. There are uh, there's different um, yoga positions that you can try that are very taxing on the body. There are some people who will sit in meditation. There are people who will create uh, art from their sigils and then destroy it. It's really uh, there are again a lot of different ways to do it. But essentially, this becomes a magic wand. Yeah, because Jeff. of there's something that I have to do, and if I didn't, if I don't do it, I'm going to oh, be. Oh God, what are you doing? I'm going to pick it up. Uh-oh. <laughs> Dana's picking up the... Uh... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I had to. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to. That's not that kind of magic wand. I mean, it's not... Yeah, it's a good magic wand, not a bad magic wand. But I had to do it anyway. Well, nice I'd work. I'd be thinking about it the whole time if I didn't do it. Uh, Jeff noticed the carving on it straight away. If you look at the carving, it kind of looks almost like a Bigfoot, mm -hmm. like a little man. He's like, oh, look, there's a strange, mysterious carving on the end of this baseball bat. What could that be for? And so we kind of told him the same thing we're talking about now, what a magic seal is, what a what a sigil is. And uh, he's like, oh, ooh, he was very interested. Yeah. And I said, here's the deal. This thing is on, is the, the sigil's not charged until you take that and you smack it against a tree. And you'll notice if you watch the episode, he does a great job of using the sigil mm -hmm. as the actual like meeting point for the tree. Yeah, he like looked to see where it was, uh -huh. lined it up. And now we have something that <laughs> nobody else has, which is a magic wand used for Bigfoot hunting charged by Jeff Goldblum. I know people are going to be curious, and I don't want to give everyone every intention that was put into the symbol. <laughs> yeah. But the the biggest one was to generate high strangeness. Mm. That's the vibe around this bat. So we have used this on Bigfoot hunts, have gotten really weird results on it. We'll continue to use it on Bigfoot hunts. We'll do a live Bigfoot hunt with museum members again, maybe around the time that this episode comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're in the museum, watch for that. We'll use the Bigfoot hunting uh, techniques that we talked about today. Uh, we'll use the pheromones. We'll do some calls and we'll use Jeff Goldblum's Squatch Knocker. So that is how we made a magic wand with Jeff Goldblum. I hope that our episode of The World According to Jeff Goldblum introduced some people who maybe are skeptical about Bigfoot into Bigfoot hunting mm -hmm. and the idea that Bigfoot hunting is not it is silly, but it, you can be silly. Mm -hmm. It's it's fun. It's play. And there's a reason that we all kind of feel that pull to do something like Bigfoot hunting. You know, for me, what I latched onto when I was a kid was ghost hunting, the same way you did. It's that desire to explore the unknown. It sometimes feels like the world has been fully explored. There's no more islands to go to and walk through a place no one's ever seen before. Uh, we're probably not going to go to space. That's just for the billionaires. So what do we do? What do we explore? We can explore the unknown. We can explore things that make us feel like the world uh, isn't boring. I think that for me, Bigfoot represents um, a wildness that still exists out there. And we're so, we live in, many, many of us live in, in parts of the world that, you know, are, they're very fast paced. We're constantly busy. We rarely ever go out into the nature. Often it's difficult for us to find ways to get out into nature. We're looking at phones all day long or computer mm -hmm. screens. And I think that Bigfoot to me really represents this wildness that still exists inside each of us. Right. This kind of healthy, attainable wildness, this desire to to get in touch with that part of yourself with kind of your inner monster a little bit. Yeah. And I love the idea that Bigfoot is still this representation of that and that the hope and the curiosity and the wonder that Bigfoot's still out there roaming around these natural, these massive natural parts of the world. It gives me hope that there's still some of that wildness uh, to be to be lived in the world that we live in in 2022. What do you think, Connor? What's Bigfoot to you? Bigfoot is, I'd, I don't remember if it was you two who said this, I think, but it really rung true with me where... 
you see a lot of Bigfoot consumer culture items in this yeah. day and age, right? So they're everybody's putting it on their water bottles or their brewery Beef label jerky. or something like that. Yeah. So it's like there's that sense of wildness, that sense of um, something that hasn't been touched. And he is, I think you said he is what the cowboy cigarette ads of the 1960s and 70s are to sort of today's time. Mm. It's a rustic, rural, mm. um, mysterious exploration figure. Yeah. And so when I see him out there in that famous pose, I first realize that this is supposed to be a masculine symbol, and it's very funny because Patty was probably a girl. <laughs> right. But we'll, we'll yeah, talk that's about so that funny. later. Yeah. But, uh, but it's definitely um, a symbol of uh, exploration and, and fun. Yeah. I also think Bigfoot's really scary. <laughs> <laughs> what about you keelan what's bigfoot mean to you i think i agree a lot with what dana was talking about like it, it's like as the more we become like industrialized and commercialized and just the idea that there is something still out in the woods that we don't know about and we haven't seen yet um and there's just an opportunity to go out there and find him yeah but also, yeah, he's really scary. <laughs> I think it was Bobcat Goldthwait, who is, funny enough, a very big Bigfoot fan. Yeah, huge Bigfoot fan. Hasn't made lots he, of films about Bigfoot? He has. Um, he, he, Bobcat Goldthwait said, the only downside about going to look for Bigfoot and not finding him is you've just gone camping. It's How great perfect. is that? There's no downside. It's perfect. I would implore anyone who's listening to or watching this podcast right now, go plan a Bigfoot hunt. Get your friends together. Go get a baseball bat. Maybe order, go to go to uh, Osmic Scientific and order some of these terrible smelling pheromone chips. Please don't. <laughs> don't do it to it's yourself. It's still over here, Craig. <laughs> it's still here. It'll be there for a while. Yeah. So I'll give you another hint, too. If you want to be a troublemaker... And you're not going to find Bigfoot with those? Just slide one under somebody's car seat. Oh, my God. Don't do that. <laughs> I feel the, like that's a crime. Maybe, <laughs> it's a crime. maybe it is. My friends and I used to put sardines in people's car heaters back in the day. Oh, God. Yeah, awful. Yeah, not good. But you could do that with one of these. So go, go find Bigfoot. Go out there and try to find Bigfoot. Even if you don't find Bigfoot, you might find more about yourself. Mm. All of those ideas about what Bigfoot is, all of those ideas about what Bigfoot and our love of monsters says about ourselves, the strangeness of the Sierra sounds and how they've endured, and the idea that Bigfoot is as magical as someone like Jeff Goldblum <laughs> is what makes Jeff Goldblum's Squatch Knocker a haunted object. The Haunted Objects Podcast is hosted by Greg and Dana Newkirk. Produced by Connor J. Randall, with photography directed by Carl Pfeiffer, and features exclusive artifacts from the New Kirk Museum of the Paranormal. To learn more about the artifacts featured in this episode, take part in live interactive experiments, and enjoy exclusive haunted objects content, become a museum member at patreon.com slash paramuseum. This has been a Planet Weird production. Do you think that Ron Moorhead was farting into that microphone? I mean, once? I would definitely do it. You got to test the microphones. We farted in every single one of these before we <laughs> yeah. set up the studio. <laughs> Sorry, Keelan. I got to go. <laughs> That's why we wanted you to smell the pheromones. <laughs> it would take away from the smell of the farts. <laughs>